Mr. Sedan, if you'd be good enough to come into the witness box, can I ask you whether you would prefer to make an oath or take an affirmation? An affirmation, please. Yes, affirm, Mr. Sedan, please. I solemnly and sincerely. I solemnly and sincerely. Declare and affirm. Declare and affirm. That the evidence I shall give. That the evidence I shall give. Will be the truth. Will be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. Mr. Sedan, thank you very much. Do sit down. Yes, Mr. Collinson. Mr. Pleasant. Uh, Mr. Sadat, your full name is Michael Sadat. It is. Uh, and your title uh, at ASIC is Senior Executive Leader, Deposit Takers, Credit and Insurers Team. Yes. And your business address is Level 5, 100 Market Street, Sydney. Yes. Uh, and you have with you, I hope, uh, a, a copy of your original summons to give evidence to before the Commission. I do. I seek to tender that. Exhibit 3.161 will be the summons to Mr Sadat. Now, Mr Sadat, you've prepared uh, two witness statements. Um, if I could ask you, please, to go to the first of those, uh, dated 18 May 2018, uh, paragraph 15. Yes. Now, I believe in line two you want to change the word community to customer? That's correct. So if you could make that change with a pen and initial that change. Oh. Yes. Uh, with that change, is your statement true and correct? It is. I tend to that statement, Commissioner. The witness statement of Mr Sadat uh, and its exhibits is Exhibit 3.162. Uh, and Mr Sadat, you have a second witness statement dated 24 May 2018? Yes. Is that statement true and correct? It is. I tend to that statement. Exhibit 3.163, further witness statement of Mr Sadat, 24 May. Exhibit 3.163. <coughs> yes, thank you, Mr Collinson. Yes, Mr Hodge. Thank you, Commissioner. Mr Sadat, I think you've said already, you're the Senior Executive Leader for ASIC's Deposit Takers Credit and Insurers Team. I right? am. And you're also the Regional Commissioner for New South Wales. I am. And you report to the Commissioner and also to the, or the Deputy Chair, Peter Kell? Yes, I do. All right. And you've been the senior executive leader of the DCI team since July of 2014. That's right. And your team has responsibility for a variety of things. One of the things that your team is responsible for is the oversight of lenders in relation to matters set out in the ASIC Act. That's correct. And that would include the unfair contract terms regime? Yes, it does. And another thing that your team is responsible for are matters relevant to the banking code of practice. That's right. And you've given the commission two statements and they, the first statement addresses the banking code of practice or the negotiations in relation to the banking code of practice. That's one thing in the first yes. statement. And the second thing that that first statement addresses is the implementation of the unfair contracts terms regime in relation to small business contracts. Yes. And then in your second statement, your second statement addresses perhaps more generally what ASIC has done in relation to the unfair contract terms regime that existed in relation to consumers before the expansion to small businesses. Yes. What I'd like to start by doing is just asking you some questions about where things are at with the banking code of practice. The ABA submitted a draft of the proposed banking code of practice to ASIC in December of 2017. Yes. And there have been some ongoing discussions and negotiations between ASIC and the ABA about the terms of that code of practice. Yes, there have been. And we've seen, and it's gone into evidence, and I'll take you to it in a moment, the latest draft that's been presented by the ABA was presented in April of 2018. Yes. And the reason that that code has been presented to ASIC is so that 
ASIC can consider whether to approve it under the Corporations Act, is that yes. right? And could you explain to the Commissioner what is the significance of ASIC approving a code under the Corporations Act? The significance is largely that um, uh, an approved code uh, is determined to meet ASIC's um, regulatory guidance as to what uh, an approved code should look like. Um, so we've got a regulatory guide, it's RG183, that sets out the criteria that we will apply when considering whether to approve a code. Um, I can run through those in, if you like, but um, other than um, the, the, the fact that we, we, we approve a code and indicate that it meets those standards, ASIC's approval does not result in any change to the legal status of the code. And how many codes has ASIC approved under Section 1101, capital A? Just one. Right, and what was that code? It was a code in relation to the future financial advice provisions. Uh, it's very much narrowly focused on the opt-in requirements that apply and the fact that there's an ability uh, for an industry to seek approval for a code that obviates the need to meet the legislative opt-in requirements. So it is a very narrow issue code. So this ABA code, if it's approved, it would be the second code approved by ASIC under the Corporations Act? That's right. And it would be quite different from the scope of the first code that's been approved in that this ABA code is much wider in application and effect than the code you've already approved? Yes, that's right. And has that presented any particular challenges, those differences in considering whether to approve the code? between the... the having You've approved one already, which is yes. a narrow code. I'm wondering if the much wider style of code that the ABA is seeking to have you approve, has, seeking to have you approve has presented any particular challenges? Um, not really. Uh, we've always had this ability to approve codes and our regulatory guidance has been in place for some time. Um, the framework was set up uh, with a view that there would be these types of broad-based industry codes submitted to ASIC for approval. Um, and this is the first time that we've had a broad-based industry code submitted to ASIC for approval. And as it is, ASIC obviously hasn't yet, perhaps won't approve the draft code that's been put forward by the ABA. That's the current situation. We haven't made a decision yet. And is it is the current draft of the code still under review? Is that what's going on? Yes. Has the review been deferred in some way while these hearings are going on in the Royal Commission? Yes. All right. And so when was the decision made to to defer reviewing the code? I, can't, I don't know the exact date. It was a couple of weeks ago, um, before the start of these hearings. And in terms of the reasons for the deferral, could you just explain to the Commissioner what the things are that, the, that ASIC is considering that they think it might be relevant to take into account from these hearings? Uh, the main sticking point is uh, the definition of small business and the monetary threshold that, that exists within the definition that's been proposed by the ABA. And so that's unresolved at this point and we're um, continuing to, to consider that issue. The reason for deferring a decision was also because we wanted to make sure that there was nothing that was going to emerge in this round of hearings that would be relevant to our consideration of whether the code should be approved. Um, we've done a broad um, uh, uh, amount of stakeholder consultation, but you know this round of hearings was also important to us. All right. Can we? bring up the code, I want to explore with you this issue of the definition of small business. If we bring up ABA.001.008.0434, and can we go to page.0443? So this is the current definition that the ABA is proposing? That's right. And in terms of the position that ASIC has communicated to date, it doesn't agree with this definition or wouldn't be prepared to approve the code with this definition in? So we haven't made a decision about that, but the, the, main, part, the main area of feedback or concern that we've raised with the ABA 
relates to part C of the definition, which is um, the $3 million uh, figure. And are you able to assist the Commission to understand what are the issues from ASIC's perspective around this figure of $3 million as compared with, presumably there are two possible comparisons. One is $5 million total debt to all credit providers, and the other possibility is $5 million for the particular loan. Yes. Uh, so our, the reason we've identified this as uh, an area that um, we've raised with the ABA is because uh, the, the independent review of the code recommended that the uh, definition be set at $5 million and $5 million for individual facilities. Um, there have been other stakeholders um, that have also argued quite strongly for a $5 million definition. And because our objective is to make the code as good as it can be, um, and certainly the discussions that have happened with the ABA since December last year have reflected the fact that we've wanted the code to improve in a number of respects. Uh, and they have made improvements in response to the feedback we've given them in, in many of those areas. Uh, but this remains the, the, the last uh, big issue for us to, to resolve. Do you understand that there are said to be prudential issues in relation to what figure is used here? Uh, we've certainly had that feedback from the ABA. And are you able to explain to us what the prudential issues are as you understand it? My understanding is that there are concerns that if um, these uh, provisions were extended to larger loans, um, that effectively there would be covenant light loans in place of, of large sizes, and that, that that would have implications for um, the, the preparedness of banks to lend, uh, because the risk that they would be taking on is greater than had they had the ability to introduce additional covenants within those loan facilities. And I, if possible, I just want to try to bear down on that so that we can get a better sense for the Commissioner of what that means. Is the issue simply that a bank might be less willing to lend for particular facilities that fall into that range of $3 million of total credit and $5 million of total credit because they're covenant light contracts? Is it any yes. more complicated than that? That's certainly the, the feedback we've had. And is there some separate issue connected with APRA and the risk weighting of assets as you understand it? That's not been the main issue that's been raised with us. Um, the main issue that we, has been raised with us is around um, the, the risks that exist for banks when they don't have the same ability to take default-based action under a loan facility. Have you had any feedback from APRA about this particular definition? We have. All right. And are you able to explain to us what that feedback is? Um, APRA has... Uh, told us that they they don't have strong views about whether the, the definition should be three or five million dollars. And in terms of the application of the code, it seems as if an issue that potentially arises with this definition is uncertainty because you can't judge it whether the code applies based simply on the particular facility being entered into. You can only determine it by reference to all of the other credit facilities that a borrower has. Do you agree with that? Yes. And is simplicity in terms of being able to understand the application of the code something that ASIC has to take into account in determining whether or not to approve the code? Uh, yes, it is one of the factors. And. Is there any way that's been identified to test the proposition about the appetite of banks to lend if the limit is $5 million versus $3 million? Test in advance of... Yes. Uh, um, this, it's been suggested to us that uh, that's not really possible. That um, And the ABA has suggested that... Um, if we were minded to approve the code with the current definition, that um, after a period of time, a review would be done to determine whether the, the, the settings are correct and whether they, they can be changed uh, 
to broaden the, the class of small businesses that might benefit from these protections. Can I just ask if we, we can take that down and go to the regulatory guide which you've exhibited <coughs> to your statement? And that's MS-13, it's ASIC.0900.0002.0088. If we go to page dot zero one zero six, this is the section of the regulatory guide that deals with independent review. Yes. And one of the conditions of approval of a code is that the code must be independently reviewed at intervals of no more than three years. That's right. And so one of the things that would happen if you were to approve the code is there would be a requirement that the code be reviewed in three years' time. That's right. And that, that review would be independent of the actual organisation putting forward the code. That's right. And presumably that independent reviewer could make recommendations as to what ought to be done with the code. Yes whether or not the organisation was prepared to adopt those recommendations would depend on the organisation. It would. And ASIC, as we understand it, couldn't say, because those recommendations have been made, we will now, that is ASIC, will now change the code. We won't be able to change the code. All we can do is um, revoke approval of the code. That's right. So what, would ha what might potentially happen is if a recommendation was made and it wasn't adopted by the relevant organisation, then ASIC could consider whether it wished to revoke the code. That's right. And I, I wonder whether you're able to help the Commissioner to understand where this code is born out of an independent review, this current draft of the code is born out of an independent review, and the independent review made a recommendation in relation to the definition and therefore of small business and therefore application of the code, but that's not been adopted by the organisation that is presenting it to ASIC. How does ASIC go about deciding whether it should approve the code in those circumstances? So it's not a strict um, requirement that uh, industry associations <laughs> implement all the recommendations that are made. It's certainly one of the considerations. Um, the way that we approach this is we um, do our own consultation with stakeholders about the issues that have been identified both through the independent review but also any other issues that might be relevant to those stakeholders. And we have discussions with those stakeholders, get their feedback, um, and then we form our own view about um, where the provisions have um, landed and whether they're um, satisfactory from the perspective of um, the regulatory guidance that we've put out. I understand. And is, is one of the considerations for ASIC in deciding whether to approve the code, whether the approval of the code would represent a meaningful improvement in the current regulation or requirements that are imposed on the particular industry? Yes, that's right. And so one of the things presumably that ASIC has to balance up is it might be that industry is not prepared to move all the way to what some stakeholders would like industry to do, but nevertheless it's a meaningful improvement compared to what there would otherwise be. That's right. All right. And then I want to ask you then about just one other aspect of the draft code, which is ABA.001.008.0434. And can we go to page dot zero four five eight? This is part of the code dealing with guarantee documents. Yes. I don't I might be wrong, but I don't think there's been any particular issues that have been raised since the draft was submitted to ASIC about guarantee documents. Is that 
Uh, yeah. Not about the documents. We, we did raise an issue in relation to reliance on third parties, but, but otherwise, uh, no. And could you just explain to the Commissioner what the issue is that ASIC raised about reliance on third parties? Um, so, uh, is it earlier in the... I think it might be. Um, Can take me to that. Um, Pause fifty one. Um, what you're thinking about if we go to page zero four five one. <coughs> yes, that's right. So just to be clear about what the issue was, the issue was about whether or not a guarantor's resources could be taken into account by the lender in deciding whether or not to make the loan. Yes. And the modification was that it was permissible to take into account the guarantor's resources, but only if the guarantor had a connection to the borrower, is that right? And also um, uh, narrowing the clause so that um, the uh, that banks would only take into account um, the resources of third parties um, that had a connection to the borrower more broadly as well. Yeah, so in fact, oh, I think I've misstated it. Being a guarantor is itself the creation of a connection between the borrower yes. with the borrower. So. Once you become a guarantor under this clause, it's possible for your resources to be taken into account in deciding whether to make the loan. That's right. All right. In terms of information that's provided to a guarantor, if we go back to 0458, what I'm interested in exploring, and the answer may be you just haven't received any feedback about this, is whether there have been issues raised with you about the adequacy of the requirements to ensure that a guarantor gives properly informed consent to entering into a guarantee. That's not really been um, a, a feature of the, the feedback that we've had. We've had feedback about the guarantee provisions, but um, the disclosures that are provided um, has not been an area that has had strong feedback. You, might, I'm not sure whether you were familiar <coughs> with the opening of these round of hearings, but one of the things that we referred to was issues raised by New South Wales Legal Aid and Legal Aid Queensland about parents giving guarantees of their children's borrowings. Mm -hmm. Is that issue of parents giving guarantees of their children's borrowings one that has come up for consideration as part of ASIC's consideration of the code? I, I believe so. Um, the feedback that we've had from some stakeholders is around the consequences that should apply if the guarantee provisions of the code are not complied with. Um, some stakeholders believe that, um, that there should be an automatic um, voiding of the guarantee if the pre-execution requirements for the uh, for the provision of the guarantee have not been met by the bank. And that was also the recommendation made by Mr Curry, wasn't it, in the independent review? I believe so, yes. That hasn't been something that's been adopted into the code? <coughs> no. And that's not one of the points of ongoing contention between ASIC and the ABA? No. Although strictly ASIC hasn't yet approved the code, so... That's right, yeah. It presumably hasn't given up any points? No. All right. I might then move to a different issue, Mr Sadat, which is the unfair contract terms regime. Um, 
Now, the legislation to amend the ASIC Act to extend the unfair contract terms regime to small business received royal assent on the 12th of November 2015. Yes. And the amending legislation provided for a 12-month transition period to the 12th of November 2016. Yes. And the need, though, to, or the the fact that the unfair contracts terms regime was going to be extended to small businesses was something that ASIC had been aware of for some time before that? Yes. And ASIC had, in fact, made, as you tell us in your statement, made submissions to Treasury in 2000 and May 2014 supporting the extension of the unfair contract terms regime to small businesses? Yes. And in July of 2015, ASIC became aware that the amending legislation was likely to be introduced in the next few months? Yes. And at that stage, ASIC thought that the transition period was likely to be six months, is that right? Yes. And can we bring up ASIC.0506.0004.7936? This is some in, or these are some internal emails from ASIC offices. Yes. And you've reviewed this in the course of preparing to give evidence? I have. All right. And if we go to page dot seven nine four zero. We might need to bring up 7939 as well on the other side of the page. So, Ms Curtis, does she report to you? She does. All right. So this is an email from Ms Curtis to you on the 22nd of July 2015, where she's identifying that you've been asked to assist with the introduction and implementation of the business-to-business -business UCT enhancements? Yes. And consistent with what we've just talked about, we see on page 7940, the first dot point, the UCT draft legislation was anticipated to receive royal assent in August or September. So that is in the next couple of months after this. Sorry, do you want me to, it's about a quarter of the way down the page. Oh yes. And then the next bullet point, once introduced, the Act will have a six-month transition period before the provisions come into effect. Yes. And then in the fourth bullet point, it's noted that Treasury has asked ASIC and the ACCC to assist businesses to comply with the new legislation. Yes. And the ACCC will receive $1.4 million for their campaign. However, funding is not being provided to ASIC. Yes. Do you know why funding wasn't being provided to ASIC for this? Um, it, it was a decision of the government. All right. And then you'll see there's then a heading which is proposed activities and it's explained, we propose engaging in the following activities. Yes. And the if you come to the very bottom of the page, you see during the transition period, if identified through surveillance work, raising concerns about contract terms that appear to be unfair with the relevant business with the aim of having the UCT changed or removed and taking enforcement or other action as necessary. Yes. Could you just explain to the Commissioner what is the type of surveillance work that ASIC would do in order to identify these types of problematic terms? Um, so for these provisions, we would typically request the contracts that are in place um, uh, the standard form contracts that are in place um, by the business and review those to determine whether they contain unfair contract terms. And if we go over the page to dot seven nine four one. And we see at the top of the page, ACCC is planning to target five high risk industries with common UCT to try and get change during this time. We could review whether we wanted to undertake a similar exercise with, for example, 
ADIs or non-bank lenders. Yes. And we'll come back to that point in a moment, but if we just also note two bullet points down, the ACCC are also undertaking the following activities using the additional funding that they have received. Yes. And there's a couple of activities which are launching launching a digital advertising campaign and releasing two animated videos. Yes. So that was, th those were, as we understand it, activities that because of the absence of additional funding, it wasn't considered practical for ASIC to do. That's right. But the idea of reviewing the common terms for particular ADIs was something that ASIC was considering doing. Yes. And as we know, that was something that didn't happen in 2015 or the early half of, or the first half of 2016, do you agree? Yes. And is there a reason why, from your perspective, that wasn't, given that it was raised in July of 2015, why that wasn't undertaken over the course of the next year? Our, our primary goal was to review a revised contracts, uh, to look at the changes that banks were making um, uh, as a result of the UCT provisions uh, being extended to business contracts. And so um, we had feedback from the banks that um, they were likely to use the full transition period of 12 months um, to update their contracts. Um, for us, there didn't seem to be a lot of point looking at old contracts if those contracts were to be replaced with new contracts during the transition period. I see. So there was a conscious decision made at some point in time to take that course? Yes. And do you know when that decision was made? I couldn't give you a precise date. All right. And so that we understand the reason for not doing it was because you'd had feedback presumably from the banks, yes. is that right? But they were planning to use the full transition period in order to update their contracts? Yes. And so then what ASIC was proposing to do was to wait until it had those updated contracts and then consider whether the updated contracts contained any terms that it considered to be unfair. That's right. All right. And the amending legislation, as it turned out, received royal assent in November of 2015? Yes. And in January 2016, ASIC began finalising an information sheet that it was intending to publish. Yes. And that was to give guidance to small businesses to assist them to understand how the UCT provisions apply to small business contracts. Yes. And that was, that was published? It was. Can I ask a question about that? Can we go to, oh, I'm sorry, I attended that document, Commissioner. Emails between Curtis Sadat and others, uh, July 2015, ASIC 0506004-7936, Exhibit 3.164. Was there some reluctance or questioning of whether the information sheet should be published in January of 2016? Not that I recall. I, perhaps if I just show you, if we go to ASIC.0506.0002.5171, We go, we go over the page. So there's an email at the bottom of the page you'll see from Mr Tanza to you. Yes. And this was sent in January of 2016. And the question that he was just posing for consideration, which you'll see at the top of the page, is, is there a reason why we are issuing the info sheet now when the law doesn't come into effect for some months? I appreciate that we are asking in the info sheet for businesses who deal with small businesses to review their standard form contracts to make sure they comply with the new law, but wouldn't that be better achieved by a more targeted communication? Th that was the reference I was making to right. some reluctance. And then if you 
go to the first page. You respond and explain the ACCC have already started in their education and subsequently Treasury has asked us to be aligned, for lack of a better word, with what they are doing. And I just want to understand, and you may not remember anymore, what is what are the considerations that go into do you issue the information sheet now or wait until it's closer to the legislation actually coming into effect? It's... It, there's not a lot of science to to this. Um, I think for this type of thing, um, th there's not a lot of cost to us in issuing an information sheet and putting it out publicly on our website. And if we think that additional communications are required, we can also provide those additional communications. Right. And you put out the information sheet and we can... Oh, I'm sorry, I tender that document, Commissioner. Uh, emails between Tanza Sadat and others, January 2016, ASIC 0506 0002 Exhibit 3.165. Thank you. And then it, can we bring up Exhibit MS-2 to Mr Sadat's statement, which is ASIC.0900.0002.0041. So this was, or well, this is the current version of the information sheet? I believe so. Do you know whether it has changed at all since it was originally published at the beginning of 2016? Not that I know of. All right. And so you see in the second paragraph it says, before the law comes into effect, ASIC expects businesses to review their standard form small business contracts to remove any terms that could be considered to be unfair to ensure compliance by 12 November 2016. Yes. And then what the information sheet does is set out or effectively summarise what the legislation provides, but also provides some examples of things that might raise issues. Yes. And this, I think I might have suggested that that was released in January of 2016. I think it was released in February of 2016. That could be right. Yeah. And I'm sorry, it was me misleading you. Not <laughs> not you saying anything incorrect. And then in March of 2016, there was a joint webinar done by the ACCC and ASIC. Yes. And the webinar, as we understand it, was geared towards small businesses to help them to understand whether the contracts that they were entering into might contain unfair contract terms. Yes. And in April of 2016, there was then a major additional funding announcement for ASIC. There was. And that was the $127.2 million reform package. Yes. And one of the things that that was for was to ensure that ASIC and Treasury are able to implement appropriate law and regulatory reform. Oh, that could be right, yes. And then... Can we, there was some internal planning or business planning that ASIC did about the use of that extra funding? Yes. And can we bring up ASIC.0506.0003.5290? So these are some internal emails setting out what are referred to as project planning summaries. Yes. And is it fair to say this is about summarising potential business plan projects that ASIC could undertake <coughs> over the next, I think it's four or five years? Yes. Having regard to that additional funding? Yes. All right. And then if we go mm -hmm. to what should be either part of or the attachment to that document, which is ASIC.0506, dot triple zero three dot five three zero zero so one of the potential projects was unfair contract terms and small business yes and 
one of the points made in relation to the outcomes of the project is that the incidence of unfair contract terms for small businesses in credit contracts is untested and may be higher than under consumer contracts. Yes. Given that, and then there's identifications of why that might be. Yes. And do you know then, was this adopted? Was there a specific project then put in place in order to deal with unfair contract terms in small businesses? Ultimately, there was. All right. And do you know when that, when you say ultimately, when that occurred? Uh, not exactly. Um, so these planning documents um, were done, as you, as you mentioned, in response to the additional funding that ASIC received. And there were a number of projects that were directly linked to that additional funding, at least for my team. Um, the work that we did on UCT was not at that point identified as a project that was linked to that additional funding. There was a range of other projects which I can talk about if you like. Um, but subsequently we made a decision that we would do work on UCT and that, that led to the work that I describe in my witness statement. And, and one of the points you would make, I assume, is there are many different demands on ASIC's resources. Yes. And ASIC has to make a decision as to how it will use its finite resources to deal with what is potentially an infinite or near infinite number of issues that arise in relation to financial services. Yes. And so it's ultimately always a matter of judgment about prioritising what are the things where we think we can best use the money and are in most urgent need of attention? Yes. And then, I'm sorry, I tend to that document, Commissioner. The preliminary planning document, uh, unfair contract terms, ASIC 0506 0003 5300 with accompanying email concerning project Planning May 16, ASIC 0506003-5290, Exhibit 3.166. Thank you, Commissioner. Now, you've referred in your statement, and we'll come to this in a moment, to a telephone call that occurred between ASIC and the ACCC at the end of August 2006? Yes. What I'm just interested in understanding from your perspective is between... March of 2016, when the webinar is done, and the 24th of August 2016, when the phone hookup happens with the ACCC, what are the things that ASIC is doing in relation to the now impending extension of unfair contract terms to small business? Uh, so I think um, I describe in my witness statement a number of presentations that we make to industry um, at various times to highlight the um, the, the incoming um, obligations. Um, we have regular discussions with industry about a range of topics, and that could be individually with institutions or, at, you know, with a range of institutions at the same time. And um, so we would, we would talk about these um, new laws in those discussions. Um, so that, that was the nature of the, the work that we did between that period. All right. And then on the 24th of August, there was a, of 2016, there was a phone call between, I think it was Richard Wexler of the ACCC and Jennifer Brewer of ASIC, is that yes. right? And you've exhibited a, a file note of that telephone conversation. Yes. And if we just go to that, which is, Exhibit MS-9, ASIC.0900.0005.0002. And what's explained on the first page is that the ACCC has been proactively looking into a handful of companies representing five industries? Yes. And then if we go over the page to dot triple zero three, it's then set out what the ACCC's approach is, which you see that about halfway down the page. Yes. And what's explained is 
initially the ACCC has been sending out letters to companies asking for contracts where contracts cannot be found online. Where the contract has been reviewed, the ACCC identifies problematic terms and adopts a, adopts a reverse onus approach, asking the company to amend the term, and if they won't, to explain why. Where there are some outstanding concerns, the company has been, will be warned of potential action after November 12. Yes. And then says the ACCC is looking to produce an industry report of 20 to 30 pages reporting on where it has landed in relation to the various industries before 12 November. Yes. And then if we just skip down, what's communicated on behalf of ASIC is that there has been limited work in the area, which includes writing to one advertiser about its credit application, responding to the Tasmanian Small Business Commissioner and writing to industry to encourage members to review contracts. Yes. And I'll come back to that in a moment, but then what's then explained is the ACCC is very keen to issue a joint media release with ASIC, which would ideally include some comments by us about banking sector contract terms. Yes. Now, I just want to understand a few things about this. Was the contents of this discussion communicated back to you at the time? It may have been. All right. Were you, do you remember whether you were aware that the review of five industries that ASIC had promised back in July of 2015 it had actually gone ahead and undertaken. That's the review by ACCC. I'm sorry, the review by, I apologise Commissioner, I'll withdraw that question and put it again. Do you remember whether by August of 2016 you were aware that the ACCC had gone ahead and done the review of five industries that you'd known about back in July of 2015? I don't specifically remember, but it's quite likely that I would have been aware at the time. All right. Do you remember whether you were aware that it appeared as if, and you might disagree with this putting of an appearance, but it appeared as if the ACCC had done much more to actively attempt to engage with the implementation of the expanded UCT provisions? I don't remember uh, that being the case, but... Um, I wouldn't sort of disagree that the ACCC had done more than us by that point. All right. And is there, in your mind, when you reflect back on this now, is there a reason or explanation for why you think they had done more than you by this point? So I think because they've received additional funding um, to do some of this work, uh, I expect that was part of the reason. Um, the other part of it was that um, uh, we had... Um, we subsequently commenced reviewing um, contracts from the banks and because we had been told that those contracts, the revised contracts, would not be in place uh, well before the commencement of the UCT provisions, um, that ultimately led, led us to uh, doing that work later than the ACCC had done it. All right. Now, one of the things that's said in that note is that ASIC has written to industry to encourage members to review contracts. Yes. We've just been trying to figure that out. So this is the 24th of August 2016. Mm -hmm. When had ASIC written to industry about reviewing contracts? I can't point to a specific communication. I certainly haven't... I don't think I've referenced a communication in my witness statement. It looks like from the communications you've exhibited in your witness statement, and we might bring up one of those, which is ms-3 asic.0020.0004.0373. Yes. Like ASIC starts writing to some of the industry bodies two days after that telephone conversation with the yes. ACCC. And one of the other things we're interested in just in relation to that letter is you see about halfway down the page it says, certain terms in bank standard form lending agreements 
have been brought to our attention as potential unfair contract terms. Yes. Are you able to just explain to the Commissioner, so at this stage on the 26th of August 2016, what is the feedback that ASIC has been receiving about certain terms in banks' standard form lending agreements? I think at that point, the primary source of feedback had been a parliamentary joint committee inquiry into the impairment of customer loans, which... I might just... <laughs> I, I would prefer that you not commit an offence, <laughs> Mr Sadat. So, in terms of... The parliamentary <laughs> Privileges Act <laughs> so uh, it just engages with us and, and with you <laughs> and with everyone. So, we're a little sensitive, Mr Sadat. We're being very careful about what you say. So, I, I understand. So, one... One issue relates to something that happened in Parliament. Apart from anything that happened in Parliament, is there anything else that you can identify that might be relevant to this point that's made here? There would have been a range of stakeholder discussions that, that ultimately led to that view being formed. All right. And then you, you see it says these terms are expressed to provide the ability for banks to... And then there's a series of five bullet points. Yes. It appears to us, but perhaps we've misunderstood it, as if that is, that list is really just drawn from the words of section 12B, capital B, capital H, of the ASIC Act. Um, perhaps it might help if I show you that. So if we put the letter on one side of the page and then bring up rcd triple zero one. And then if we go to page dot double zero seven two. So this is, you know, as part of the statutory regime, there are examples given of what might constitute an unfair contract term. Yes. And so it looks like the first one, which is void or limit their obligations, is 12BH subsection 1, subsection A, a term that permits or has the effect of permitting one party to avoid or limit performance of the contract. Yes. And then unilaterally terminate the contract is subsection B, a term that permits or has the effect of permitting one party to terminate the contract. Yes. And then penalise the borrower for breaching or terminating the contract while avoiding such responsibilities themselves is subsection C, a term that penalises, has the effect of penalising one party but not another party for a breach or termination of the contract. Yes. And then the fifth bullet point, unilaterally vary the, con the contract terms is subsection D, a term that permits or has the effect of permitting one party but not another party to vary the terms of the contract. Yes. Do you know whether apart from just adopting the general statutory examples, whether there'd been any identification of a more specific terms that were common to ADI's contracts that had been identified as problematic? I think we'd done some work on that. Um, but I, in, in terms of this particular communication, it was written at a more general level and it was written to the industry associations rather than the individual institutions. I understand. And that then raises an interesting question, which is why write to the industry associations rather than to the particular, particularly the large ADIs at this stage? The industry associations represent um, the large and small institutions, and for us it was more efficient to write to these industry bodies. Um, the other thing I would say about the, the population of institutions that we regulate is that they were all... Uh, very much aware about about these new protections. Um, I think in contrast to the ACCC, which has responsibility for the entire economy, um, the institutions that we regulate uh, had been actively involved in the development and passage of this legislation, um, including a lobbying against the legislation applying to them. So we were not concerned at all that they were not aware that the legislation had come into effect or when its commencement date was. 
But it does raise an issue, doesn't it? They're aware of the legislation and as you pointed out, because they've been actively lobbying against it. Yes. And it follows you are aware of their resistance to the legislation and its application to them. Yes. And perhaps it might be thought that that would be a reason for ASIC to very actively seek to make sure that they were going to have contracts that didn't contain unfair contract terms by the time the legislation came into effect. Yes. So I'm just wondering, how do you reconcile <coughs> what seem to be those competing ideas? Well, I think that's what we ultimately did. We, um, through the work that we did um, after this period, after this letter was sent and the work we did um, uh, shortly before and after the commencement of the, the new uh, obligations, um, our intention at that point was to uh, get the industry um, lifting its standards and approach to compliance with the UCT and doing that on, on an industry-wide basis, um, and starting with, with the big four banks in particular. Can we go to ASIC.0024.0003.0044? This is an internal email chain where the proposal seems to be made for the first time to begin reviewing the lending contracts of some of the big banks. Yes. And if we look at the bottom of the page, we see Ms. Brewer, who'd been on the telephone conference with ASIC, sending an email on the 1st of September 2016. Yes. And she says, as discussed, so she's obviously already had a discussion with Ms. Curtis, I propose that we review lending contracts to small business that are secured over property, as this was the type of contract and concern that was considered in the loan impairment inquiry. And then she sets out the following, an identified list of the following lenders that could be reviewed. Yes. And says that they could ask for touch base before sending an information request to be able to further specify the type of agreement that would be sought. Yes. And then there's the list there of the big four and a number of other banks adding up to 10 or so. I think actually, yes, 10. Yes. And then the response, or Miss Curtis forwards that email on to you and explains that and this is now on the 6th of September 2016, and says it's proposed to see, send out an information request to those banks. Yes. Had there been some change so that you now thought that the banks had finished making the amendments to their contracts? No, I don't think we knew that at that point. All right. So, but there, what, this then represents a change of approach because you were going to wait until the contracts had been amended before reviewing them, and now you're just moving in to try to review them. Well, I think at this point, given that the, the legislation was commencing within two months, we felt it was appropriate to, to obtain copies of those contracts. Attend to that document, Commissioner. Emails between Curtis Sadat and others, September 16, ASIC 0024, 0003, 0044, uh, Exhibit 3.167. And you approved the proposal, what was proposed here? I believe so. And then on the next day, on the 7th of September, there were letters that were sent out to ANZ, Commonwealth Bank, National Australia Bank, Westpac, Suncorp, Heritage Bank and Rabobank. I believe so, yes. Right. And I think you set that out, if it helps, at paragraph 27 yes. of your statement. And you've set out in your statement that there was then various correspondence with the banks, and this begins, perhaps we go to page 10 of your statement, dot zero, zero, one, zero. Yes. 
I give the document reference again. It's ASIC.0902.0007.0001. reference I've got for the statement is what you're after, is it, Mr Hodge? Yes. Is ASIC 0902-007-0055. That's a statement reference. Thank you, Commissioner. You have a different document ID for me, which is Particularly favoured then. I wonder if I've got the same statement. <laughs> I hope I have. We'll find out soon enough. <laughs> yeah. Can we... Go to page 10 of that statement. <clears throat> Thank you. So what you set out in your statement starting at the bottom of the page in paragraph 35 are then the communications that then occur between ASIC and the major banks? Yes. And so in the case of all of the banks, <coughs> there was a letter that was sent on the 7th of September 2016 saying that ASIC would like to review the standard form small business contracts to determine whether the contracts contained potentially unfair terms. Yes. And if we go over the page to page 11, And we see on the 12th of September 2016, ANZ responded and, amongst other things, said ANZ was reviewing standard form contracts across several business units to ensure that it captured all standard form lending contracts which may be offered to small business customers as defined by the UCT provisions. Yes. And that its <coughs> review of contractual documentation was ongoing. Yes. And... If we then go over the page, we can see there's some back and forth between ANZ and ASIC about various terms of the contracts. Yes. And then if we go to page 13, dot, page 13, we see the... This is a slightly different version of the statement. We see that there's a response on the 9th of November 2016 to ASIC's letter from ANZ. Yes. And then similarly, if we then go, we see the next bank is CBA. If we go to the next page, we see the final piece of correspondence before the 12th of November 2016 with CBA is an email on the 10th of November 2016, which is an acknowledgement from ASIC to CBA. Yes. And then the next bank, we go over the page, is NAB, and if we go to the next page after that, we see there's the last piece of correspondence is an ASIC acknowledgement on the 10th of November 2016. Yes. And then the next bank is Westpac, and if we go two pages over, We see there's the last piece of correspondence before the 12th of November 2016 is another acknowledgement email from ASIC to Westpac on the 3rd of November 2016. Yes. And then the next bank is Suncorp. Yes. And that's over the page. And if we go over the page again, we see or over the page again, we see the the last piece of correspondence before the 11th of no, before the 12th of November 2016 is ASIC confirming an extension until the 30th of November 2016. Yes, and 
one of the things we were trying to understand then is between the 12th of November 2016 and the issue of the joint media release by ASIC and the Ombudsman in March of 2017, what does ASIC do in relation to reviewing or further reviewing these say if we just start with the big four, the big four's contract terms. So there was quite a lot of activity around that time which was related to this work, including the work of the Small Business and Family Enterprise Ombudsman. They'd done, they'd conducted an inquiry which was relevant to this uh, work and we, we had provided input to, to that inquiry. Um, that inquiry produced a report in December 2016. At the same time, the banks were reviewing their code of banking practice and one of the areas that was of particular focus was around the protections in the code for small business borrowers. And so uh, there was effectively some overlap between um, our work to ensure that the banks were complying with the UCT laws, but also getting to an agreed uh, industry position on what the industry would do to protect small business borrowers. We might return to that question in a, in a different way in a moment. What you tell us in paragraph 40 of your statement is that after ASIC had completed the initial review, and I think the correspondence we just referred to, that's the initial, the bringing in of documents for the initial review. Yes. And the conducting of the initial review, is that right? Yes. That after it had completed its initial review, that it had identified a number of terms in the small business loan contracts that it considered were potentially unfair? Yes. And you also tell us in paragraph 41 of your statement that during this process, ASIC became concerned that some of the banks whose small business contracts ASIC had reviewed had taken what you describe as being a minimalist approach to ensuring their small business loan contracts complied with the UCT law? Yes. They appeared to ASIC to have made only a few changes that were deemed absolutely necessary? Yes. And, or I should say or, they had merely inserted the word reasonable into particular terms to qualify what was otherwise what I think you've described as a broadly stated and potentially unfair contractual right? Yes. And does it follow then that in ASIC's view, such changes were not sufficient to make the contracts comply with the new, new UCT law? We were concerned that they weren't sufficient. And... And did the banks approach surprise ASIC? No. And so as at the date of the commencement of the law on the 12th of November 2016, ASIC remained of the view that of that selection of small business contracts that it had reviewed, a number of those provisions contain a number of those contracts contained provisions which in ASIC's view were unfair? Potentially unfair, yes. And therefore not in compliance with the law. Yes. And that, that reflected the general approach that the banks seem to have taken to reviewing their contracts. Yes. And you, you have emphasised the word potentially unfair. Could you just explain to the Commissioner why you place a particular <coughs> emphasis on that word? Partly because ASIC cannot make a determination about whether a term is unfair. Only a court can decide whether a term is unfair. And so uh, the way we approach this is to um, identify where we have concerns, um, but we wouldn't specifically or explicitly state that a term is unfair unless a court had found it to be unfair. I understand. Now, can we bring up ASIC.0506.0002.8421? Sorry, can we just go back to the answer you last gave? Um, would ASIC uh, consider uh, expressing its view that a term was unfair? Uh, we, we could express our view. No doubt you could, but would you consider expressing, for example, to a bank, 
the view that, in ASIC's opinion, Clause X of Contract Y is unfair because? Uh, yes, we, we, would, or we would do that, um, although, Commissioner, I think we would only do that where we had um, formed a view that we were prepared to take that matter to court and seek a declaration on that basis if the bank were not to accept our position. We would, if we weren't yet at the point at, at being uh, ready to commence proceedings, we would probably stop short of stating directly that a term is unfair in our six view. Yes. Mr Sadat, the document that's now up on the screen is a chain of internal emails to which you're a party from ASIC from October of 2016? Yes. Have you reviewed these documents again in the course of preparing to give evidence? Um, so I, I can't exactly recall what's beneath this particular email. Maybe if you show me how that will jog my memory, but... That's fine. We'll go to that in a moment, which is a briefing paper. What I just wanted to understand was, was there a, do you recall whether in the middle of 2016 there was to be some meeting between the ACCC or with the ACCC about unfair contract terms? If it helps, if we go over the page. We see an email which is, hi Warren, further to Jenna's email requesting a briefing on the UCT provisions for your meeting with the ACCC next week. Do you recall whether there was a meeting to occur? I don't specifically recall. All right. And then if we go to the attachment, which is the briefing page paper, and that should be ASIC.0506.0002.8423. So th this is a two-page briefing paper. We can see at the bottom it's dated the 12th of October 2016. Yes. And then if we go over the page to the second page, see approach to enforcement. Yes. And what's being set out there is ASIC's summary of what ASIC's approach is going to be to enforcement. Yes. And then at the second half of the page, ASIC's summary of what it understands the ACCC's approach is going to be to enforcement. Yes. And ASIC's approach is that the deposit taking credit and insurers team, which is, is that your team? It is. Expects businesses to proactively review their small business contracts to ensure readiness by 12 November 2016. However, a consultative approach is proposed where ASIC will assist non-compliant businesses to comply with their obligations in the first few months of the new regime. Yes. And if a business is uncooperative, then enforcement action will be considered. Yes. And on the other hand, you see the ACCC's approach, which is set out halfway down the page. Yes. They are currently following a consultative approach, working with businesses to ensure that they are ready to comply from 12 November. Yes. From 12 November 2016, they intend to take enforcement or other substantive action where they find breaches of the UCT provisions. Yes. And that's a, a fair summary of the divergent approaches that were being adopted by ASIC and the ACCC at that time. I think. Um, I think the thing to point out about that is that um, I would, it, it would appear based on um, the evidence that the ACCC provided yesterday that the definition of what constitutes enforcement action is not exactly the same between ASIC and the ACCC. So uh, when we talk about enforcement action, um, we have a specialist enforcement team within ASIC. That's not my team. and. Uh, we have under our legislation the ability to commence formal investigations and then take court action if necessary. Um, and when that work is being conducted by an enforcement team, we typically refer to that as enforcement action. 
Uh, but there's a, there's a range of other regulatory action that happens um, outside of ASIC's enforcement teams, including in my team, where we um, reach outcomes with institutions and get them to modify their behaviour without having to use uh, people from our enforcement team as part of that work. Um, I understood from yesterday's evidence that the ACCC would describe some of that work as work falling within the definition of enforcement action. I think they called it administrative action. Um, so um, I think the dichotomy is not as clear cut because the, the two agencies take a different approach to how we're structured organisationally and the way that our powers work and the way that we conduct our surveillances and investigations. Can I just make sure I understand what it is that you're describing as the difference? If either the ACCC or ASIC commences litigation, that would fall within the meaning of enforcement? Yes. For both of them, as you understand it? Yes. If either of them accepts an enforceable undertaking, would that fall within the meaning of enforcement? Um, for us, it probably would, although that work might be done by an enforcement team or it might be done by my team. Where it's done by an enforcement team, it typically attracts the enforcement label. Where it's done in my team, um, it may not attract the enforcement label. And then you were referring to administrative action. That's the, that's the thing where you think there might be some difference? Yeah, so the, the types of outcomes that were described included um, engaging with an institution and uh, telling them that they need to make changes to their contracts and having that resolved without the need for a formal um, court proceeding or even an enforceable undertaking. Um, and that type of work happens a lot as well at ASIC. Um, but it's typically not done by enforcement teams at ASIC. It's done by my, the, the kind of team that I, I work for at ASIC. Perhaps we might have a different understanding of what the ACCC is talking about with an administrative resolution. You understand an administrative resolution is something formal that the ACCC commissioners resolve on? Is that your understanding? No, that's not my understanding. So, so your understanding when you talk about an administrative resolution is that there's just an agreement reached between the between ASIC and the lender? Yes, and, and a media release is then published to record the outcome of that agreement. Okay. And so the drawing is that it might be that the ACCC would regard reaching an agreement that they, from which they then publish a media release as something that falls within enforcement, whereas you wouldn't. Well, that's how I understood Mr Gregson to describe that work. And in fact, the fact that that work occurs within what is called the ACCC's enforcement area. Right. And, and I, I'm just trying to figure out then, is it your view that there isn't actually as significant a difference in approach between how ASIC went about dealing with UCT and how the ACCC dealt with UCT as appears to be the case? In broad terms, I would say that's right. I know that the ACCC has commenced uh, litigation against two institutions or two firms, but in broad terms, I would say that um, whilst the ACCC did receive additional funding and did conduct more education and outreach and um, also did a review of industries prior to the commencement of um, the legislation, that our general approach to enforcement is, is very similar. I'm not sure whether you are or aren't answering my question. My question was about how you'd approached, how each of, each of the regulators had approached the expansion of the UCT to cover small businesses. Is that what you're dealing with? Or are yes. You, it's just at the end of your answer you said our approach to enforcement isn't that different. In relation to the UCT? I see. Just if I can test that for a moment. Stepping back even from the unfair contract terms expansion to small businesses, since the unfair contract terms regime came into effect in 2010, how many court actions has ASIC commenced in relation uh, to the UCT? We haven't commenced any court actions. All right. There has been 
a court action commenced in relation to unfair contract terms under the ASIC Act? By ASIC? No. By the ACCC? Yes. Uh, under delegation from... Yes. Yes. So the only... Am I right in thinking the only regulator that has commenced an unfair a piece of litigation under the ASIC Act in relation to the unfair contract terms is actually the ACCC. Yes. And that was done by virtue of the delegations that ASIC and the ACCC sometimes exchange in relation to matters. Yes. And to be fair, to make sure the Commissioner understands that in context, that particular piece of litigation was litigation that the ACCC had commenced against Europe Car, is that right? I believe so. And so it's likely that the explanation for the delegation is that for some technical reason it was found that the particular service that was being offered by Europe Car fell within the definition of financial service. That's right. So it wasn't something that was ordinarily subject to regulation by ASIC. Correct, yeah. And so that's why the ACCC needed to use the delegation in that case. Yeah, for the avoidance of all doubt. And just thinking about that, putting it in that context, that there hasn't been any litigation commenced by ASIC in the past eight years in relation to the unfair contract terms regime, do you still think that the approach to litigation of ASIC and the ACCC is the same? To litigation? I'm sorry, you, you were framing it as enforcement, were you, which includes litigation? Which, yeah, overall. Perhaps if we just take litigation, do you think the approach to litigation is the same? It is to the extent that if we encounter businesses that are uh, including terms within their contracts that are unfair and those businesses um, don't change their contracts in response to concerns that we've raised, um, that we would take, uh, we would commence proceedings against those businesses in inappropriate circumstances. And again, if you think about this in the context that you've explained as at the 12th of November 2016, which is that you had the view that of the big four banks, they had terms in their contracts that may have been unfair contract yes. terms, and that they had shown, these are my words, not yours, but little appetite to meaningfully change their terms. Sure, yes. And that that was a view that ASIC held, that they'd made only token efforts to try to change their terms. Yes. And that that was consistent with, I think you agreed with the Commissioner's question earlier, that was consistent with what ASIC expected of them. It wasn't surprising to us. I wonder then whether you can explain <coughs> why not take the position of saying, we are not satisfied with your terms and if you haven't improved them by the 12th of November 2016, when the, then when the legislation comes into effect on the 13th of November 2016, we're going to go to the federal court and seek a declaration. So there was a, a number of uh, considerations um, that informed the approach. Um, uh, we saw this as an industry-wide issue. It wasn't just an issue confined to, to one institution. And we were seeking to get um, an industry-wide um, outcome in relation to how banks and other financial institutions approach the UCT laws. Um, and so with that in mind, and, and given the banks in the subsequent discussions that we had with them, um, given that they were prepared to consider further changes to their contracts, um, partly due to the public pressure that had been applied on them um, through things like the review that the Small Business Ombudsman had done, but also um, because of the, the fact that their code of banking practice was under review and that they were looking to make commitments to take, um, take them beyond what the law required. Uh, we saw that as an opportunity to get um, an outcome with the big four that we could then leverage across other financial institutions. When you speak of an industry-wide approach, are you speaking of industry-wide agreement or are you speaking of industry-wide compliance? The two are radically different, I would suggest. Yes, Commissioner, I think we were aiming to get an outcome that, that went beyond the strict requirements of the law. 
I don't think, uh, I'm not sure that you've answered my question. Uh, were you seeking industry-wide agreement or industry-wide compliance? Well, uh, maybe I don't understand the question. I think probably both. An, ag an agreement that they would modify their contracts um, so that it would comply with the law and, and you know, potentially go beyond the law. Yes. And so, just so I understand the, the methodology, the methodology was to try to get the big four banks to move. Yes. Is that right? And then once the big four banks had moved, to then try to leverage that with the smaller banks. Yes. And when did ASIC form, formulate that plan? <clears throat> Probably in late 2016 and early 2017, because we had a series of discussions with the Small Business Ombudsman, and we decided we would work together on that, and that was the strategy that we, that we decided to go with. And so before the small business, small business Ombudsman became involved, what was the strategy that ASIC was pursuing? Well, it, it, it was, well, it, we would have, I think, effectively executed a similar strategy, but without the Small Business Ombudsman's um, input and involvement. As at the 12th of November 2016, was there any strategy? In terms of? Of attempting to get banks to actually comply with the law. Yes, so we'd reviewed their contracts, we'd identified concerns. Those concerns were not limited to one bank. So the strategy at that point was, how do we get the, in the industry more broadly to comply uh, with, the, with the UCT? Can we bring up ASIC.0506.0003.2018? This is the joint media release that was put out by ASIC and the Ombudsman? Yes. On the 9th of March, 2017? Yes. And the, this was as a result, is it fair to say, of significant pressure from the Ombudsman about ASIC taking action in relation to unfair contract terms? Uh, what, what do you mean by pressure? That is, the Ombudsman was coming to ASIC and raising the issue and pressuring ASIC to do something. Um, the Ombudsman was certainly raising the issues with ASIC, but we had already started work on this and we had already reviewed the <coughs> bank's contracts and the Small Business Ombudsman was interested in working with us to put pressure on the banks to comply with the law. And. In the media release, is this accurately setting out the views that ASIC had at the time, that, as, that is, as at 9 March 2017? Yes. All right. And so its view was that the big four banks have substantial work to do to eliminate unfair terms? Yes. It refers to a joint review of small business standard form contracts undertaken by ASIC and the Ombudsman, when was that joint review undertaken? Um, I think that was undertaken in, um, in November, December of 2016 and possibly into early 2017. And what was the nature of that joint review? So we had an external expert assist us with uh, the review of these contracts and the identification of terms that uh, were potentially unfair, and uh, together we we identified the the four broad themes that we felt were the priority areas for us to focus on. Did I'm sorry? Did ASIC and the ombudsman jointly engage an external expert? Initially, it was the ombudsman that did. Right. Yeah. Was it? And this was as part of the ombudsman was conducting an inquiry at that point in time. Had, in, uh, yes, that's in right. In late 2016. That's right. And had the Ombudsman engaged an expert in order to review the big four banks' contract terms? I think that was part of it. 
And when you're talking about the review that was undertaken, was that the review undertaken by the Ombudsman's expert? With, in conjunction with the Ombudsman's expert, following the publication of the Ombudsman's report. I see. So the Ombudsman, I just want to make sure I've understood it correctly. The Ombudsman engaged an expert to assist her as part of her report? Yes. And then she published her report? Yes. And then after she published her report, was there some engagement between ASIC and the expert? Through the Ombudsman, yes. And then we ultimately then appointed that expert ourselves. All right. And when did you appoint that expert? I think it was in April of 2017. Okay. So after yes. the joint media release. All right. And then ASIC's view as at March 2017, together with the Ombudsman's view, was that having reviewed small business loan contracts from eight lenders, you had each found that there's been a failure to take sufficient steps to comply with the new obligations under the unfair contract terms regime? Yes. And that that was despite being provided with a one-year transition period? Yes. All right. And then you see at the, the bottom third of the page, it says, in their initial review, ASIC and the Ombudsman found lenders continue to use clauses of concern, and it lists various clauses. Yes. And just so I, again, understand, is that referring to the review that had been undertaken by the Ombudsman's expert as part of the Ombudsman preparing her report, or is that as part of ASIC's review of both. the terms? But you both identified these clauses yes. of concern. Yes. I tender that document, Commissioner. Joint media release, ASIC and ASBFEO, 9 March 17, ASIC 0506 0003-20018, Exhibit 3.168. And actually, just before I move off that, can we go over the page to 2019? You see there's a quote there from the Deputy Chair, Mr. Kell? Yes. And it says ASIC is committed to ensuring the UCT provisions help to raise small business lending standards. Where we identify a potential unfair term, we will work with the lender to remove or amend the term. And we have already started to raise these issues with lenders. Yes. Just so I understand, it, the reference to having already raised these issues with lenders, is that a reference to the correspondence that is referred to in your statement between September and November of 2016? I there wasn't some subsequent dialogue with lenders after November 2016, was there? Uh, not, no. And then it says, if the lender refuses to do so, we will consider all regulatory options, including taking the matter to court, as ultimately a court can decide whether or not a term is unfair. That's right. Why work with the lender? Why not just say, do it? Um, so there was more than one lender that had um, that had these terms in their contracts, um, yes. and we we have to balance um, the, the 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 different options. If a lender is is prepared to um, uh, make changes in response to the concerns we've raised, um, that can often be a faster and more effective way of getting that change in place. Um, as distinct from going down the path of taking court action. And so we were... Uh, we were taking court action might or might not follow uh, saying, do it. My question is, why say in a media release, we will work with those who are not complying, rather than saying those who are not complying with the law should do so? I think that's, that was effectively what we were aiming to do, um, but without the power to direct a business to, to behave in a particular way, I think um, perhaps our language was a bit more circumspect, but um, you know, I think the clear message in this, in this media release was that we wanted the banks to, um, to make changes. Or to come and talk to you about the changes that were required to be made, yes. Now, can I then take you to wbc.107.001.7204? 
Thank you. Do I, Commissioner, this document is already an exhibit. It's an exhibit to the statement of Ms O'Donoghue, the witness from Westpac who gave evidence yesterday. Mr Sadat, you see this is an email of the 9th of March 2017 from Mr Moyes, who is the head of regulatory response at Westpac to you and to to other people, I'm sorry, to Mr Kell and copied to you and to Ms Brooks of yes. Westpac. And have you reviewed this email in the course of preparing to give evidence? I have, yes. And Mr Moyes, I will summarise the email, as, expresses surprise at reading the joint media release that ASIC had issued with the Ombudsman. Yes. Do you agree with that? And he expresses surprise because of what he describes as an apparent finding that lenders have failed to take sufficient steps to comply with the new UCT obligations. Mm -hmm. And sorry, just because it's being recorded, yes. you'll need to say yes. And, and that, what he describes as an apparent finding, that's an accurate reflection of what you'd put in the media release. Do you agree? Yes. And the reason he expresses surprise is because he says, you may be aware that we engaged ASIC in advance of the UCT regime extending to small business. And we also responded to ASIC's requests to see our relevant small business contracts, including those for before and after the UCT changes came into place. We had not received any further requests from ASIC or any direct feedback since this earlier engagement. And so we were a little surprised that we were singled out with the other larger banks in today's release. Yes. And his summary of what had occurred appears based on what we've looked at to be accurate. That is Westpac had engaged with ASIC in those couple of months right before the UCT came into effect and then there hadn't been anything that had followed. Do you agree with that? Yes, we hadn't engaged bilaterally with Westpac um, it, subsequent to um, uh, the middle of November 2016. Um, and, and that's because we were working to identify the common issues that needed to be addressed across the big four banks. And so what I'm struggling to understand, I think, is the strategy that is being pursued <laughs> by ASIC, which as I've, as best I can understand it so far, was in July of 2015, ASIC considered whether it should review the contracts of ADIs. Do you agree with that? Yes. But it didn't do so? Not at until... That time. No, not at that time. That's right. And it knew that the ACCC was undertaking this review of... I think the ACCC was saying five industries. It ended up reviewing seven industries. Right. And... As I understand it, at some point in time, either at the end of 2015 or the beginning of 2016, ASIC decided that it wouldn't review the contracts because it would wait until the banks had actually revised their contracts. That's right. And then at the end of August 2016, ASIC sent letters, which was sort of generic letters to some of the major lending associations. Yes. And then in September of 2016, ASIC then appeared to embark on a different strategy, which was to engage with the lenders and to get copies of their contracts. Yes. And then come the implementation date, ASIC wasn't satisfied, that is come 12 November 2016, ASIC wasn't satisfied that the bank's contracts were in compliance with the UCT regime. Yes. But... ASIC didn't engage with the banks after the 12th of November 2016 up until it published its media release on the 9th of March 2017. That's right. And it also didn't take any enforcement action against the banks in that period. Well, back, I'm sorry, I should put it more generally. Yeah. It hasn't taken any enforcement action at all against the banks. You mean court action? Yes. That's right. Well, has it taken... Um, has it taken any enforcement action 
against the banks in respect of UCT. Well, during this period, we're looking to enforce the law by getting the, the terms within those contracts changed. During the period 12 November 2016 to 9 March 2017. Up until 12 November, when we're reviewing the contracts to understand the changes that have been made, and subsequent to 12 November, when we're working out the position um, around what terms still need to be changed, our approach at that point is to, um, to get the changes and, and enforce the law. I'm, I'm just not or sure. Or prevent continued breach. I, I'm sorry, Commissioner. Did or prevent continued breach. Yes. All right. Can we bring up WBC.104.002.2610? This is an internal email of Westpac that is summarising a discussion that has occurred between Ms O'Donoghue of Westpac and Ms Brooks of Westpac with people from ASIC, although the people are not identified. Yes. Do you know whether one of the people was you? I can't be certain. Um, I don't think so, but I can't be certain. All right. And <coughs> this was a document that was <coughs> tended yesterday through Ms O'Donoghue. What the email records is ASIC having said to Westpac, so this is mid-April 2017, ASIC advised that it had only undertaken a very high-level review of Westpac and other lenders' small business lending documents but was continuing to review at a more granular level, notably with Kate Carnell? Yes. Is that an accurate statement of where, where, where ASIC was at as at mid-April 2017? So this was after we'd issued the media release yes. in March 2017. Um, I think we had identified the four key areas of focus um, that we wanted the banks to make changes in relation to. So I don't know if I would describe that as high level, but what happened subsequent to March 2017 was that quite a lot of work was required to be done um, about the, the detailed um, uh, construction of the, the clauses within the contracts that the banks had. And so that, that's what, uh, what was happening, uh, both following the media release, but also following a round table that we held with the banks, uh, I think in May 2017 where we reached agreement on a number of, uh, of, the, of the issues. And then you see the second bullet point that's attributed to ASIC is that ASIC recognised that Westpac had already amended many non-monetary default clauses but stated that Westpac was not compliant with the UT, UCT standard for non-monetary default clauses and, to a lesser degree, unilateral variance terms. Yes, I see that. And do you know whether that reflects the view that ASIC held at the time about Westpac? I, I don't remember the specifics. Does it seem odd to you in the context of whatever strategy it was that ASIC was pursuing that it hadn't communicated this to Westpac earlier? No, because Westpac wasn't the only bank we were dealing with. Well, perhaps had you communicated it to other banks? So up until March 2017, no, we hadn't communicated those issues directly to the banks. Um, what we wanted to do with that media release was effectively draw a line in the sand and articulate the position that we'd reached, having reviewed their contracts and identified the four areas that we thought were the high priority areas for them to focus on. And then... You see, the next point is ASIC's comments today are the first confirmation that ASIC considers Westpac to be non-compliant. Yes. And do you accept that 
the first time that ASIC informed Westpac that it considered Westpac to be non-compliant was the 13th of April 2017? No, I think they, they should have gotten that message when we put out the media release in March 2017. Oh, I see. They, they should have understood from the media release that you were saying everybody's non-compliant. Correct. Yeah. All right. And then it also goes on to say, however, ASIC indicated that Westpac is one of the more compliant lenders that it has reviewed. I don't, I don't understand the, the specifics of that, that comment. Well, do you, rem you obviously, by, by April of 2017, you've reviewed at least the big four banks' contracts. You'd also seemingly been reviewing Suncorp's contracts. I believe we had, yes. And do you remember whether of the big four banks, Westpac was one of the more compliant banks? I don't. Um, at this point, banks were making different changes and were offering up different proposals in response to the concerns that had been raised by us and the Small Business Ombudsman. And so at any point in time, the relative position of one bank versus another bank was effectively in flux. And I don't specifically remember at this point in time that Westpac was more compliant. <coughs> Can we then bring up another document, which is RCD.0014.0013.0001? Is this that next media release that it you is, were referring yes. to? So this is issued on the 16th of May, 2017? That's right. And this is after there's been a round table hosted by the Ombudsman and ASIC. Is Correct. that right? Yeah. And if we go to page dot triple zero two. You see about well the third paragraph says the Ombudsman and ASIC have publicly raised concerns that lenders, including the big four banks, needed to lift their game in meeting the unfair contract terms legislation. Yes. Can I ask something about that? language, this is a joint media release? It is. Is it fair to say using expressions like needed to lift their game probably isn't the typical type of expression that ASIC would use in a media release? That's probably right. And one of the things this reflects then is that ASIC is in a position where it has the ombudsman pushing it and pushing the language that it's using in relation to unfair contract terms? Yes. And then if we go over the page to dot triple zero five, it says ASIC Deputy Chairman Peter Kell said, we made it clear that lenders had to significantly improve their lending agreements to small business to ensure they meet new rules. Yes. And is that the message that was being conveyed at the round table by ASIC? Yes. All right. And it says at the bottom of the page, in March 2017, the Ombudsman and ASIC completed a review of small business standard form contracts and called on lenders across Australia to take immediate steps to ensure their standard form loan agreements comply with the law? Yes. I'm just trying to understand the statement that the review was completed at that time. Is it... That seems somewhat inaccurate in terms of ASIC's position. Is that fair? So I think it reflects the fact that it was in, in March 2017 that we were ready to publish that media release. And it was at that point that um, we put out the position publicly. Attender that document, Commissioner. Uh, media release 16 May 17 of ASIC and ASB FEO, RCD 0014, 0013, 001, Exhibit 3.169. And then there were negotiations that went on between ASIC and the big banks over the course of the next 10 months or so? Yes, I would say, yes. And then eventually ASIC published a report 
in March of 2018, is that right? Yes, the negotiations or the discussions were largely complete, I would say, by August 2017. There were some remaining issues that needed to be addressed, um, you know, including, for example, uh, Westpac's approach to cross defaults. But um, we had largely reached the position that we were looking for by August 2017. And in, when you referred to, for example, that Westpac cross default issue, can I just understand that that issue is still ongoing as at March of 2018? Uh, I'm not sure if it was still ongoing as of March 2018. I think it, perhaps was... I can help you by showing you a document. Sure. Can we bring up WBC.414.002.0409? <coughs> Can you give me the number again? If Sorry, no it's one else. WBC.414.002.0409. <coughs> and if you look at the bottom of the page, you see an email from Mr. Green of ASIC to Westpac. Yes. And we can probably pop that out and see on the 6th of March 2018, ASIC was saying, ASIC once again reiterates its position that any non-monetary event of default under a separate finance facility or security agreement, which is treated as an event of default, as say a cross default under the main small business loan contract must fall within the specific events of non-monetary default as per the ABA's position. Yes. So I, I think that probably helps you to yes. answer my question, was the issue ongoing as yes. of March 2018? It was still ongoing. Yes. And how has it been resolved? Westpac has made the changes that we were looking for. All right. Has Westpac published its contracts as of yet, as of yet do you know? No, I don't believe they have. I think they've published a waiver document that it sets out the changes they've made and that, that waiver document is being provided to uh, small business customers. I think importantly though, in relation to not only Westpac's changes, but all the changes that have been made by the big four banks, um, the position that we reached was that these changes would be retrospective back to 12 November 2016, so that no customer, no small business customer would be disadvantaged by the failure of the banks to make those changes as at 12 November 2016. Well, let's just reflect on that. The effect of the legislation from the 12th of November 2016 is that if the term is unfair, it is void. You agree? Yes. So if these terms have been amended in order to remove unfairness, but for their amendment, they would be void as of the 12th of November 2016. Do you agree? Yes. So I'm not sure that I understand why the banks retrospectively agreeing to amend terms that would otherwise be void is a particularly significant improvement on the position. Are you able to explain that? Oh, I think it is, a, it is a significant improvement because I think it means that in practical terms, no small business customer is disadvantaged. And is that because the alternative would be the bank might seek to rely on the term and then it would be necessary for the small business customer to go to court to seek a declaration that the term is void. That's right. Presumably, one of the things that could have happened is that if there were particular types of terms that were a cause of concern for ASIC that it had identified as at November 2016, it could have commenced a proceeding or multiple proceedings against one or more of the banks seeking a declaration that particular terms in particular contracts were void. We could have done that. And not only would that have affected the particular term if it was declared void, but also it presumably would have set a pretty clear benchmark for the rest of the industry. Perhaps. I think the, the risk with that is that um, because the terms do vary from contract to contract and arguments about what a lender's legitimate, ex legitimate um, 
uh, interests are can vary. Um, sometimes what we find with with um, uh, litigated outcomes is that the, the the outcome doesn't necessarily have a broader applicability. And in this case, an outcome against one bank in relation to one contract about one particular term may not necessarily have a broader applicability if you have a slightly differently worded term in a different contract. When you say sometimes we find that the litigated outcome isn't effective, I just can we just understand that ASIC hasn't had any litigated outcomes from the unfair contract terms no, regime? That's right. I was talking more generally about litigated outcomes in terms of the fact that they're often decided on their facts and sometimes those facts are not more broadly applicable to other circumstances. All right. And I think you're not... Litigated outcomes is really something that's for the next witness from ASIC to speak right. about. Is that fair? And were you here in the hearing room yesterday when the witness from Suncorp gave evidence? I was. Did it concern you that now, yesterday was the 31st of May 2018, today's the 1st of June 2018, that Suncorp still doesn't know or hasn't completed its review in order to determine whether the terms in some of its contracts are unfair? Yes. And when you reflect on... We, I'm sorry, I should ask, were you aware of that before that evidence was given yesterday? Yes. And how long have you been aware of that for? I couldn't give you an exact date, but it's... Um, it, it, people in my team uh, raised that with me in the last couple of weeks. That Suncorp still hadn't completed its review? That, that's right. What about other banks? Does ASIC hold a concern about whether, say, Bank of Queensland has properly reviewed its contracts to bring them into line with the unfair contract terms regime? Um, so uh, we've got a concern more broadly that other institutions may not have made changes um, that are necessary, <coughs> and we've commenced a piece of work to review the contracts of other both bank and non-bank lenders to understand whether they've incorporated um, the changes that we've outlined are necessary in Report 565. And just if you, if you reflect on the Suncorp situation, does that suggest to you that there's been any failure on the part of ASIC in relation to the implementation of the UCT regime in relation to small businesses? A failure of, of what in particular? Of ASIC. In so ASIC is implementing the legislation. Yes. It's the regulator responsible to it. My question is, hearing Suncorp say pretty candidly they didn't know and hadn't completed their <coughs> review, I'm wondering if that suggests to you any failure on the part of ASIC in the way it went about implementing the new regime. Um, I, think, I think the strategy that we embarked upon to make sure that the big four banks uh, had changed their contracts in the way that we felt was necessary um, was the right way to go, that they have about 83% of market share when it comes to small business lending. And having them set the standard um, is very important because the rest of the industry does look at the conduct of the big four banks. Um, and so I think given um, that we were um, able to reach the position we did with the big four, including in some respects as a result of the fact that the Code of Banking Practice was being reviewed, um, making sure that the commitments that, that were uh, being made went beyond the, the strict requirements of the UCT law, um, I think that was a good outcome. And I think it's now something that we're able to apply more broadly. So ADIs like Suncorp, who are members of the Australian Banking Association, will, as a result of the, the, the changes to the banking code, um, be held to a much higher standard than what the law requires. And um, our concern is now to make sure that those who are not members of, of that <coughs> industry body and who don't subscribe to the code of banking practice um, are also doing the right thing. When you reflect on what's happened, are there ways in which you think ASIC could have done a 
better job in implementing whatever its strategy was in relation to UCT? I think um, if we were able to um, reach a position, um, it reached the position that was ultimately reached in March 2017, had that position been able to be reached sooner, um, then I think... Uh, do you mean March 2018? Sorry, March... No, no, March 2017, as in the setting out the position in terms of where the concerns were. Had we been able to reach... Had we been able to crystallise that position um, sooner than March 2017, um, then I think we would have been able to um, get the result that was ultimately um, referred to in May and then August 2017 sooner than that and have those contracts updated and in place uh, before the commencement of the UCT regime. But I guess due to a combination of factors, including the fact that the banks hadn't updated their contracts and we hadn't crystallised our position in terms of what additional changes were required to meet UCT, um, that, that wasn't able to happen uh, sooner than it did. Can I just ask one other thing, which is just connects to the last module that the Commission of Inquiry undertook in relation to financial advice. Has there been any consideration that you're aware of as to the application of the unfair contract terms regime to financial advice contracts? I can't tell you off the top of my head. Is that something that's within the ambit of your responsibilities or outside your responsibilities? It, it would be within the ambit of the financial advisors team at ASIC. All right. Thank you, Commissioner. I don't have any further questions. Thank Mr. Sedan. Is any party other than uh, ASIC seek leave to cross-examine Mr. Sedat? No? Mr. Collinson? Just three matters uh, in re-examination, <coughs> Commissioner Pleasers. Um, Mr. Sedat, you mentioned uh, twice, I think, um, that the um, process you described that occurred between ASIC and the banks, um, as it turned out, went beyond the strict requirements of the UCT law. Um, and you first gave that evidence in response to the Commissioner's question which drew a distinction between compliance, whether, the, whether ASIC was looking to insist upon compliance or agreement from the banks, and you answered uh, after a little while both to that. But are you able to expand for the Commissioner's benefit on what you mean by uh, going beyond the strict requirements of the law? Um. So a few things. The, the banks have um, agreed to um, apply the approach that was agreed in order to meet UCT compliance to loans of up to $3 million, uh, which is significantly higher than the $1 million threshold that applies to loans that are greater than one year and higher still than the requirements that apply for loans of less than 12 months, where the UCT law is... is has a threshold of $300,000. Um, the other elements to that are that some of the specific commitments that have been made in relation to, for example, uh, specific events of non-monetary default and, and the fact that the banks have confined themselves to, I think, 12 specific events of non-monetary default. I think it's arguable as to whether other potential events of non-monetary default would also be permissible by the UCT law. Um, and so the, those kinds of changes that the banks have agreed to make, um, given that the law um, does allow uh, for banks to have in their contracts terms which may be one-sided but within the, you know, within the legitimate interests of that bank, um, I think we've reached a position which is a really good outcome for small business customers because it gives them both certainty but also um, means that um, a range of potentially other terms that might be legally permissible are not included in those contracts. And um, you're aware that the Curie review came out in 31, on 31 January 2017? Yes. Um, and there was a process of engagement between ASIC and the banks in relation to the draft code during 2017? Yes. In giving your evidence just now about the banks going beyond the strict requirements of the law, are you referring just to their uh, 
discussions with ASIC in respect of their contracts or the code as well? Both. Um, in relation to this period, and this is my second question, uh, between 12 November 2016 and March 2017, um, which you were asked questions about, um, and the question of what ASIC was doing in that period, um, you made reference, I think, to the Curie review, which I said a little earlier was dated 31 January 2017, and also the report of the Small Business Ombudsman, which I can tell you or remind you came out on 3 February 2017. Are you able to expand for the Commissioner's benefit on what the relevance of those impending reports was to the period November 2016 to March 2017? So those, those inquiries and reports identified um, both, um, so the Ombudsman's report identified areas which um, she felt included conduct that fell short of the law, but also conduct that she felt was important for the banks to adopt um, that went beyond the law. So there was a, a range of recommendations that the Ombudsman had made to the banks about um, improving their conduct. Um, at, at the same time, Phil Curry, through his review of the Code of Banking Practice, um, was Sorry to interrupt. Can I just interrupt you? Did you see any drafts of the Ombudsman's report before its final release on 3 February? Um, I think we may have, yes. Yes. So if you could continue. And so the work that Phil Curry was doing at the same time um, in identifying opportunities for the banks to um, include um, uh, initiatives or clauses within the Code of Banking Practice that went above the minimum requirements of the law was also an opportunity for us to um, identify um, uh, specific commitments that the banks could make. I, have to, I should say that around this time, um, the banks were telling us that um, whilst they um, were, um, were willing to make further changes to their contracts, that their, that their position was that they had in fact complied with UCT, but that they were willing to make more changes. And I think partly that was due to the recognition that they were required to make additional changes in any event because the Code of Banking Practice would, would ultimately see that happen. And did you see drafts of the uh, Curry review before it was finalised? Yes, we may have. Yes. Um, now, if, if hypothetically ASIC had commenced proceedings, that is court proceedings, uh, against one or more of the banks in, say, December 2016, um, doing the best you can, because it's really a hypothetical question, w what do you think the effect would have been upon this process that occurred between ASIC and I think that you described was substantively concluded by August 2017? I, th I think that depends on whether any litigation was contested by the banks, um, and I expect it would have been contested. And I think in that scenario, um, uh, it, it's quite likely, I think, based on experience with other cases that ASIC has been running, including a current case against Westpac in the federal court, um, that it would have taken much longer for ASIC to get a declaration that any of the terms that we were concerned about were unfair. Leaving aside getting a declaration in the court, what effect would it have, would it, in your view, have had on the process of uh, engagement between ASIC and the banks that occurred, I think, substantively between about March 2017 and August 2017? So I think in that case, uh, had we commenced proceedings, there would have been no further discussions about changes being made to contracts because the banks would have effectively um, awaited the outcome of that litigation before making changes. Just one last point. I think you covered this, but um, Suncorp is uh, a member of the ABA? It is. So the new code would apply to Suncorp's dealings with small business borrowers? It will. Yeah. No further questions. Yes, thank you. Mr. Hogg. Nothing arising from that, Commissioner. Yes, thank you very much, Mr. Sadat. You may step down. Thank you.